In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So this past week, of course, was Valentine's Day, and although my family doesn't like to participate too much in the commercialized holidays, or as some people in my family will say, the fake holidays, you know, I still try to hedge my bets and try to earn just a couple of brownie points if I can. And so I made a trip down to where they sell greeting cards, and I began to notice that contextually, where you are in your stage of life and your relationship, there is a greeting card for you. So if you're in elementary school, it's roses are red, violets are blue, girls are icky, and so are you. (laughs) If you're a a newlywed, then it's, you know, very loving and enthusiastic, you know, roses are red, violets are blue, I cannot live without you, you know, so... (laughs) so romantic. Which one did you say? And then, of course, there's the third option, which is for those people who have been married long enough that you wonder if you've been married too long. (laughs) Where it says, roses are red, violets are blue, it's your turn to do the dishes. (laughs) I talk about that because when we read today's gospel, of the Beatitudes, we try to take it a lot of different ways, and I've preached on the Beatitudes in the past a few different ways. The Beatitudes are sometimes seen as Jesus' sermon that introduces the kingdom of heaven, letting people know this is the order of life that you're going to experience in the kingdom of heaven, that those who are on the bottom will be on the top, and those who are doing well right now, you kind of may not do so well depending on how you have treated other people. The other way we've also seen it is that warning, you know, we have the woe to you, really hitting home that in Jesus' time there were those people who were on the top of society religiously and monetarily and politically who were hurting others and that that is not the kingdom that God intended. But I wanted to think about it differently and I invite all of us today to wonder what if The sermon that Jesus is preaching today is a love letter to his people. What if it's a way that Jesus is preaching to say, this is the way to love and happiness? And if we put it in that context, then we begin to see that we can easily compare the way the world teaches what love and happiness should be about, and the way that God and Christ try to teach us what happiness is about. Because there is a big difference between the two. I use the word happy because the word blessed in that Greek, and the word blessed as we heard in Psalm, is the word happy. And so we've got to wrap our minds around this word happiness and what it's supposed to mean. So what does the world say is the key to happiness? Well, the world says that happiness can be bought. In fact, it's available at your local store or dealership. It can be easily purchased. And the bigger thing that you buy, the happier you and I will be. And of course, having stuff is fun, but that happiness can be fleeting. I tried to explain that to a friend of mine and said, you know, buddy, you can't buy happiness. And he says, you're right, Alex. I can't buy happiness, but I can rent it for a long time. (laughs) And that's the attitude the world wants us to have, that this idea of happiness is a commodity. What does God teach? God teaches through Christ that Happiness is about devotion and sacrifice. It is about loving others in a deep and meaningful way, especially loving God in a deep and meaningful way. The other thing that I notice is happiness, according to society, means never being sad. It means never having any difficulty, never having any challenges in our life. And so when we encounter that way of happiness and we hitch our wagon to it, so to speak, we end up discovering that that happiness doesn't last very long. 
What's the other side of that? Jesus himself in the sermon today teaches that happiness can still exist in the midst of our sadness and our trials. What does Jesus say to his disciples? Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who weep, for you will laugh. It's not only saying and acknowledging that there's sadness and tragedy in our life, but it's also saying it's not the end. Because what do we hear about society? Happiness is promised to no one, right? What does Jesus say? Jesus isn't afraid to make any promises when he says, Blessed are you who are hungry, you will be filled. Not you might get filled, not you might laugh, not you might inherit the kingdom of heaven. It will happen. And the only way that that promise can be fulfilled is through Christ. And that kind of comes up to really summarize what the difference is between the happiness that the world promises and then the happiness that God promises. I don't mean to keep doing it that the people here are unhappy or that they're of the world and then these are all the godly people. So let me say that the world promises and that God promises so that we can be even here. I don't want to do that to you is that if you notice, happiness in the world often deals with not making commitments to one another. Kind of going through the world detached. Superficial friends, superficial acquaintances. But Christ says, attachment and devotion, especially to God, are what matter. So I came across a wonderful booklet that I read and uh, for those of you who don't know, we, we marched in the Martin Luther King Jr. Day Parade, uh, you know, last, last month. And uh, we found ourselves in a very strange position. We were behind the ACLU float, and in front of this float were the group called The Way to Happiness. Okay? And they were giving out these books. The Way to Happiness. And I thought, how convenient. It's a small book. I can read this in one sitting and immediately find the way to happiness. And it seemed really convincing and innocuous at first because it even has a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. It can't be that bad. It's got to be something good. And so I started to read it. And I do read the things that people give me and stuff outside of Scripture stuff. And it started to have good advice. Don't murder people. I can... I can, I can get on board with that. <laughs> Don't steal. Great also, wonderful. Be tolerant of other people. All right. This, I mean, so far it is batting a thousand. And then I got to the end of the book. And I don't know if you've ever encountered this with the things that you read. It's not what it says. It's what it doesn't say. At no point in this book does it use the word God or Jesus Christ. And so I looked at the fine print, which you should always do. The Way to Happiness Foundation International. Okay. This may be the first non-religious moral code based wholly on common sense. That should have told me right there. <laughs> and it was written by L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. Ah, we know who that is. So for those of you who may not know, that's the Scientology group. And so the reason I bring this book up is because it's so easy to be duped. It's so easy to listen to the wrong voices instead of Christ that want to give us just enough of what looks like truth before it leads us astray. And the thing that is missing from this book is that the way to happiness is also the way of the cross. There is no path to salvation. There is no path to happiness or joy unless we pick up our cross and follow Christ. And in the end, that's what the Beatitudes are trying to tell us about this relationship between happiness and sorrow. So as I reflected on Valentine's Day and began to think about the Beatitudes, I remembered the best marital advice I ever got. 
besides Joe who told me burn the roast. That way they never make you cook again. (laughs) Burn the sauce, burn whatever, okay? But the best marital advice I ever received was this. When you wake up each and every single morning, Alex, you must choose to be married. It's not a passive thing. You don't just wake up and say, well, I guess I'll go do this marriage thing, kind of back my way into it. He says, you must choose to be married and be an active participant in your marriage or you really don't have a real relationship. We must choose to be Christians every morning that we wake up. Every day that God gives where we have breath in our lungs and our heart is beating, We must choose to be Christians. It's not something that we just wake up and go, Oh, I'm here. It's Sunday, I guess I'll go to church because, you know, that's where my friends are. No. And so that's the choice that I would like each one of us to contemplate. Today is already taken. When we go to bed tonight, pray on that question. Think about that question. So that when we wake up in the morning... We are honest with God. Lord, do I want to be a Christian today? Or not? Because there's going to be days where we wake up and we say, I don't want to do this. There's going to be days when we wake up and we say, it hurts too much. It's too difficult. It's too demanding on my time. People are laughing at me. I don't want to let people know about my faith. There's going to be those days. But we must be honest with God and depend on His grace to help us answer that question. Because nobody can answer it for us. So when we wake up tomorrow, we put our feet on the ground, and hopefully it's not grass or anything, it's just, you know, carpet or tile. Ask that question of ourselves. Do I want to be a Christian today? Amen. Amen.